Okay, so I was asked to talk about this, uh, and uh, um, we really don't have many uh, geophysicists here, I don't think, but uh, we're supposed to be uh, partially a geophysics program. I seem to have unplugged my computer. And these are also serve as, as uh, just some examples of applications of QMC methods. Um, Oh, I think here's where I have the picture of the cubic boron nitride, so maybe you'll see it again here. So uh, I, I want to start, I, I, I want to mention work by other groups, too. I don't want to just, uh, you know, uh, uh, pretend that we're the only people applying QMC methods in geophysics or high pressure, though really the, the number of examples is pretty small uh, so far. Uh, but, for example, this is one of the early papers uh, applied to high-pressure geophysics in 2005. And when I say high-pressure geophysics, I'm excluding hydrogen. There's kind of a whole separate, and, and Dave separately has been, a, you know, a master of this and a pioneer in this area, so, and, and in helium, okay? So those two areas, there's been tremendous amounts of work done, and I'm not going to talk about them, okay? So I'm going to talk about examples in, in, call it solid earth geophysics. Okay, so magnesium oxide is really the simplest oxide. And DFT actually does an excellent job on MGO. Uh, so I'm not quite sure why uh, 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 Alfe at all. I don't even have the authors written on here. I should have. This is a paper by uh, uh, Alfe at uh, University College London and, uh, and uh, Mike Gillen and, uh, and uh, Needs and Taller using the casino code. And I'm not quite sure why they worked on MGO, except that it's kind of the simplest oxide. It's the simplest, call it the simplest geophysically important material. And uh, uh, though DFT actually does a pretty good job on it. But they ap applied QMC to it. And actually, to tell you the truth, if you, I'm not going to go through all of these numbers here. Our original number from like uh, uh, 1990 or 88 or something with LAPW is here. And it's really still, I think, the best number out there. Really, their final results, you know, are really pretty good agreement with the DFT results. I mean, uh, their, their transition pressure from the B1 to B2 structure is actually, I think, probably too high. Uh, they got like 600 GPA, and DFT gives like 500 GPA. But, uh, but they say, but, but, but their errors in, in lattice constants and equations of state and so forth are really uh, uh, on par with, with uh, um, you know, other, uh, with, with DFT calculations and really not in perfect agreement with experiments. So, so if you look at their uh, bulk modulus, they get 183 GPA and the experiment is like 160, okay? So, so uh, that's kind of the error that you expect to see in, in, uh, in DFT kind of calculations. And this is believed, they say themselves in their paper, I mean, that it's probably due to the pseudopotentials they used, okay? So here we come back to the fact that, you know, you do a great job, but your results in the end are gonna be dependent on, on the pseudopotentials. So, so, uh, so that's really an area that needs, uh, you know, some care. And I think they would, if they did this again now, they would probably, uh, you know, do this a little differently. Um, so this is from that same paper. I just want to point out why getting these, these uh, transition pressures is so difficult to do. Uh, they didn't really plot any error bars here, and they should have, okay, as we learned on Monday. So this shows the, oops, this shows uh, uh, the enthalpy in volts, okay, as a function of pressure. And this, the pressure range here is small. It's 580 to 620, so this is a pretty small pressure range here. And, uh, but the uh, enthalpy range here is like, uh, like a whole volt per atom, okay? So you see the uh, energies change a lot, you know, a as a function of pressure. And uh, where these two curves cross is where the transition happens. So you can see that typically, uh, maybe always, uh, when you have one of these high pressure phase transitions, uh, the enthalpy, you know, determining where two enthalpy curves cross, you know, if you have error in one curve or the other, even just a, you know, a systematic shift up or down, you know, that will move that pressure around a lot. So, you know, so, so there's a big problem with, uh, you know, uh, with error propagation in terms of, you know, uh, computing phase transition pressures. And this shows the same thing for DFT. You see, uh, for LDA, you see, I mean, it gives a somewhat different pressure, but you see it's, you know, it's really uh, hard to make an argument about, you know, these tiny changes here. If you actually put the error bars on here, you would see that, you know, Really, they should have said, you know, plus or minus 100 GPA or something, you know, but they didn't do that. 
And I talked about this on Monday, that very often in DFT, uh, when you look at uh, a phase transition pressure, you'll find out that it's wrong uh, with a given functional, but uh, with some other functional, you know, the equation of state parameters will come out better. And that's one of the things, you know, we want to get beyond, you know, beyond DFT to be able to, uh, you know, not be uh, choosing different functionals for, for different properties. So just to give you a little bit more detail about that study, that, that study was done by Kevin Driver, who's uh, now uh, uh, at, at Berkeley with uh, Burkhard Militzer. And is Kevin's here. Yeah, he's in the back. Okay. So uh, this is a famous paper of his in uh, Proceedings in the National Academy. And um, so uh, this is uh, uh, the stichovite structure. You see it's a real tool structure, a very dense structure with eight coordinate, uh, with uh, with six coordinated um, silicon. And then uh, the quartz structure is a very open structure with four coordinated silicon in this kind of tetrahedral uh, framework. So, uh, so I had talked on Monday about how uh, uh, DFT does a pretty good job for each of these phases independently, but, uh, but not so well uh, for the transition between them. And so uh, we did uh, QMC results using, uh, in this study we used Casino and compared it with uh, different functionals. And we found that, you know, doing a good job on, uh, you know, with QMC gave essentially experimental error on the energy difference of, of quartz and stichovite. So, so, uh, so that was the first thing that we did, uh, was just see that if you really work hard, you can get, uh, 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 you know, good results with DMC. If we had gotten bad results here, maybe I wouldn't be here today and I would have just given up on you know, QMC altogether. So maybe it's good that this just worked out <laughs> because uh, we were, had a little bit of beginner's luck here maybe because, you know, we, we, we used uh, just a kind of standard non-local pseudopotentials, you know, DFT pseudopotentials. We used DFT trial functions. You know, we did everything in what seemed to me the obvious way to do it is I learned more later and learned that, you know, you can get different results with different pseudopotentials. I guess we were, were lucky, okay? But uh, by the way, when I talked earlier about the different results with different pseudopotentials, those are very different pseudopotentials, okay? So one of them was a Hartree-Fox pseudopotential, one of them was a DFT pseudopotential. I mean, it wasn't like a small little tweak in your pseudopotential gives you different results. I mean, if you do a good DFT pseudopotential, you'll get, you know, a uniform set of results. And maybe someday, by studying maybe many more than you know, four or five materials, we'll know that if you use a certain pseudopotential, you'll get good results, okay? But you know, right now, we just, I don't think we can really say that. So uh, I showed you those enthalpy curves for uh, MGO. You see it's a similar sort of story here in the case of SAO2, except maybe not quite as bad in terms of the relative slopes of the two lines here. And that's just related to the fact that uh, in the case of MGO, both of those high pressure, fa both of those phases had, were very stiff, had similar elastic constants. In the case of quartz and stichovite, quartz is a very soft phase and stichovite is a very stiff phase, so that gives you more different slopes to the curves here, which makes it a little easier to determine where the transition pressure is. Uh, it was also very uh, 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 nice that we got really within experimental data for the different equation of state parameters, so that like, uh, uh, for the bulk modulus for quartz, uh, you see we got like 39 GPA compared with 38 GPA from experiment. I mean, this made me feel at the beginning when we first started this that, that you know, working on geophysical materials with QMC, that, uh, you know, this was the, the golden, uh, you know, road where we could get basically perfect results, you know. And, uh, and similarly for stichovite, we got, you know, very good agreement with the equation of state. So uh, we haven't really used this idea, but I still think this is worth following up on. But you need more than, than just one material to uh, test this. But, uh, but here's a whole route that you know, somebody could work on if they were interested. Uh, we looked in some detail at comparing QMC and DFT and trying to understand where the differences came from. And I showed you uh, a slide on Monday that showed that if you use different exchange correlation potentials, you really can't see much difference in the charge density that comes out, and it's hard to look at that and understand any physical reason for why one density functional works and one doesn't. Uh, but one thing that's very interesting is if you look here, this plots the, um, uh, the energies from uh, uh, DFT and the QMC energies here on the same scale on, uh, as a function of volume. So you see this, this set of, this points here on this curve, 
you know, you can do those on your, I, I used to say laptop, but you could probably do them on your iPhone now, you know, in, in you know, a few minutes. And, uh, and uh, you know, these, you know, obviously these DMC calculations take a long time to do and to do all of the finite size corrections and everything. But in the end, you see it looks almost like, you know, just a rigid shift in the energy. And uh, at least on this scale. And if you plot the, um, the uh, uh, if you plot it on a different scale so that you plot uh, uh, basically, again, just the, um, uh, the energies, what am I plotting here? Yeah, 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 the difference between the QMC results and the DFT results that are shown here uh, for both stichovite and for quartz, you can see the behavior is quite regular and, uh, and really uh, comes down to just looking like an energy shift of, of a few uh, 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 hundreds of, of, uh, of Hartree's per, per molecule, uh, so a few uh, tenths of volts per molecule, and then a, uh, essentially a change in pressure. So you see this pretty much looks like a straight line, so a straight line is like a, a pressure change. So you can take these results and you can see that, that uh, the, the, the point is, is that in the case of uh, stichovite, uh, the energy shift is different than in the case of quartz. So uh, in the case of quartz, it's like two volts different uh, per SiO2 um, in, the, in the QMC energy and the DFT energy, whereas it's like one volt per SiO2 in the other case. So, so there's really kind of a systematic uh, behavior. And in the, there's kind of like a five to eight GPA shift in the pressure. So in the case of quartz, it's like eight GPA. In the case of stichovite, it's like five GPA. So, so you know, it'd be interesting as, as time goes on and more and more materials are studied, you know, it would be useful to do this kind of analysis and see if there's any kind of systematics. I mean, it would be, you know, the DFT community would like to know that, you know, all we need to do is shift our pressure by 5 GPA and we'll get perfect results. But you see it's different for two materials, but, you know, it's only a few GPA different. But anyway, and in fact, you'll find this in the literature. So, you know, you'll find, uh, uh, you know, buried in some DFT paper, especially in geophysics or high pressure physics, uh, we applied a pressure correction to the results. I mean, I hate that because then you don't know, you know, what the real results are unless you uncorrect, you know, the results. But, but uh, you know, sometimes you see papers that are essentially perfect I'm going to get in trouble because this is all webcast, right? But anyway, so uh, you'll find papers that, uh, you know, that look like perfect agreement with the experiment. You have to dig into them. And this is kind of like in chemistry, you know, this is, well, you know, this scaling that you find in chemistry that very often people will, you know, use the conventional scaling, which means that, you know, they took all their Hartree-Fock frequencies and, you know, multiplied them by 0.9 or something like this, you know. And, and uh, you know, so people, you know, you know, you have to delve into these papers and see, you know, what people actually did with their results before comparing with experiment. Um, okay, so I don't want to belabor this too much. I already talked about this on Monday, but uh, you, know, you don't see much difference in the density itself uh, between different density functionals. Um, now, Kevin went far beyond just looking at the equation of state and the phase transition in, in, in quartz and stichovite. And one of the things that he did was uh, uh, calculate uh, uh, elasticity uh, for really I, I would say the first time, except maybe it's the only time. I mean, I don't know if it's still been done in other materials, and this was a few years ago now. But uh, doing uh, calculations of the energy versus uh, 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 strain to get out uh, an important elastic constant in stichovite, uh, the, this shows DFT results, and I'll show the QMC results in a second. But the idea here and why this is important is that low pressures, uh, it looks kind of parabolic. So you have basically the energy versus strain, uh, is, is, uh, is uh, uh, it's stable and parabolic. As you go up in pressure, it develops this instability and you get this double well, and this, so it's essentially there's a ferroelastic phase transition under pressure, uh, which drives stichovite to this so-called calcium chloride structure. And that was found with DFT uh, some years ago. Uh, I found that with DFT, uh, but now we wanted to look at that with QMC. Now, th in that case, DFT really worked perfectly, so this is really more of a benchmark study than uh, than, uh, and to see if it's possible. So the problem here is this energy scale is very small. So you see this is like a few hundredths of an EV to, to map this out. And you see the well depth is, you know, less than a millivolt or something. So, so you know, can that be done with QMC? And so, uh, so this was a big deal at the time that he did it. You know, over two million CPU hours on the new Franklin system. Now retired, I added here. 
as I prepared this talk, okay? So this machine is now, you know, it was the best machine in the country, you know, at the time that Kevin did these calculations, you know, very short time ago, and now it's unplugged, okay? So, you know, this is the nature of the field, right? So you have to make your codes portable because, uh, you know, if they only work on one machine, you know, it's only going to work for a few years, you know? Anyway, so, um, so uh, this shows uh, both VMC and DMC calculations, and here you see the error bars. So, so, uh, so um, uh, you know, and these error bars are important because if you just show the curve, you know, I mean, you haven't shown anything, really. So, and that, uh, of course, is the beauty of QMC is that you actually get error bars. I mean, with, you know, even if they're bad error bars, you know, at least they're error bars. I mean, when you do DFT, you have no idea if your results are good or bad. You know, with QMC, you can at least get some error bars. Of course, uh, there's things that don't fall into your error bars like, uh, you know, effects of the pseudopotential, but we won't talk about that. Okay, so... And this gives you an idea of how much time it takes to do VMC versus, uh, you know, versus DMC, uh, though, you know, there are many more points here on the VMC side than on the DMC side. Well, so the nice thing is it actually worked, okay, and there had been some controversy at the time, and this is one reason why we did it, because some, you know, experimentalists, my good friends, you know, had said that we were just lucky with the prediction of the phase transition of the calcium chloride structure because this group, you know, including Tom Duffy here, had done experiments and shown, you know, somewhat different results with the elasticity uh, originally. Uh, but then they ended up in the end coming out with agreement with our results after we did the QFC. So you have to be a little careful about that too. Okay, so, uh, but basically here's this shear elastic constant versus pressure. And so uh, uh, here's experiment and you, uh, done with Brillouin scatter, and here is the DMC calculation. So you see you have some error bar from the DMC, but you know, within their error bar is the experiment. So that's nice. And really, the VMC calculations really are in pretty good agreement too, though there is some shift from the DMC one. So I think there is a role for VMC for these kind of calculations as well. I wouldn't just discount it. I mean, if you have a system you know, that just isn't... DMC is just not tractable for, you know, you still might be able to use VMC uh, for it. And um, so anyway, we did get agreement uh, with the DFT calculations and with the experiments of how this shear constant uh, uh, vanishes. Well, that wasn't uh, all that Kevin did. He did a lot more. And this just, again, to show you kind of ideas about how you can proceed with this, this shows thermal expansivity as a function of uh, uh, temperature. Uh, for uh, uh, quartz and stichovite. And uh, you can see experiments are not perfect either. Okay, so these points here are from experimental data. And you can see these were actually published. So, I mean, so, you know, they were not, not ashamed to publish these data. Okay, and you can see the scatter here. You know, it all looks very good at, you know, b below room temperature, but as you go up in temperature, even in a standard material, I mean, quartz, SAO2 is a standard material used, you know, even in crystal radios, you know. So, I mean, uh, uh, you know, this is, a st you know, uh, in your watches and so forth, you know, this is a standard thing, and yet, you know, the experimental data uh, jump all around. And uh, so we were able to do with DMC, a, a combination of DMC and, and, and DFT, uh, you know, pretty good IG, uh, job on, on, on the uh, heat capacity, the, um, you know, thermal expansivity and so forth. And for stichovite, you know, the data are even much sparser, but here's the experimental point. You see the calculations really go right through the experimental point. So, I mean, it looks like we can calculate these thermal properties pretty well with the combination of QMC and DFT. So, uh, so to kind of uh, justify that a little bit, because I've, I'm showing that, but I really haven't explained it, is, uh, you know, it seems that... Uh, 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 you know, very often DFT does a pretty good uh, job with the phonon uh, density of states with the phonon frequencies at a given volume. And, and like I showed you in that earlier slide, uh, you, the big difference between, uh, you know, the DFT results and the QMC results is really in the, in the energy itself. So certainly if you're studying something like uh, atomization energies or something like this, you're going to see very big differences. Uh, but, uh, but also in, in, in the pressure. So there's a shift in the equation. Say once you make those two corrections, you know, DFT is actually not so bad, at least for these classes of materials. Actually, for everything that we've looked at. Um, let's see. So uh, if you look at the quartz stichovite phase diagram and you properly do uh, uh, the um, uh, propagation of errors, uh, you get this, uh, 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 I don't know what color this is, this violet area here. 
And uh, you see, it's really not that bad. And actually, it's much better than most of the experimental estimates. So uh, uh, experimentally, you don't really reverse that transition because, uh, because uh, it's a metastable phase transition because there's other phases like coazite that come in on the phase diagram. Uh, but, uh, but people are still interested in this phase transition anyway, even though it's metastable. And uh, you can see that uh, the different experimental studies shown by these different color lines uh, are, um, you know, uh, differ in terms of their slope and, and, uh, and so forth. And uh, really, I think we have probably a much better estimate of where that boundary really is than from experiment. If you look at the DFT calculation for this line, you see it's way off, okay? So, you know, even though DFT worked pretty well, you know, in the end, it just doesn't, you know, doesn't work for that. Now, when we went to higher pressure where there's really more interest uh, in the transition to this alpha lead oxide structure, which is of importance because it could incur, uh, occur in the very deep mantle, uh, just the way that the two phases happen to be much denser and much stiffer meant that the errors propagated in such a way that we got a larger error band. And, you know, I, I guess we could have run, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, four times longer or something and gotten, you know, smaller band, but Kevin kind of wanted to finish his doctorate. And so, uh, so in the end, you know, this is our error band here. But still, I think it's better than the experimental estimates. One of them gave actually negative slope for this transition, and we actually very clearly saw a positive slope. Uh, that depends on the, uh, you know, the relative uh, uh, sign of the, uh, you know, entropy change of, and, and the volume change of the transition. Of course, the volume change is such that the high pressure phase is the smaller volume, but, you know, the delta S for the transition, the sign of that is actually different in, our calculations and this experiment, and probably this is just inaccurate. And here's another experimental study over here. So really, you know, I think we came, even though we have a large error band, and I think these are, I don't remember now, these are one sigma or two sigma error bands. Do you remember, Kevin? That's one, sigma. one sigma. Okay, so it's worse if you really look at the two sigma band, but, you know, this is a one sigma error band here. But still, I think we're doing as good a job as experiment. Okay, I mentioned about cubic mohr and nitride before, and this is just the structure, so I just want to point out this simple structure. It's basically like, like, a, you know, like, a, uh, like a diamond structure. And I talked about this stuff with the pseudopotentials before, so I, I just kind of put them in for... Oh, so th this I didn't talk about before. So this is really the, uh, the Raman mode versus pressure. Uh, the calibration that we did, including the anharmonicity. And I think this is also, you know, something that's uh, edifying to look at. So the experimentalists, this is the region that they did their experiments on, this little box here, okay. So we did our calculations over this whole range here. This dashed curve is the, is the function that they published from their experiments over here. And you can see what a great job they did. I mean, so that's why I say, you know, I can make fun of experimentalists all day, but, you know, in the end, you know, that, that and of course, this is my colleague, uh, you know, uh, Alex Koncharov, but, but uh, 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 you know, they, and it's not some simple polynomial or something. I mean, they, I don't know how they came up with this functional form, but whatever it is, you know, they ended up with this function that has, like, two parameters to fit, and they fit it, and it really looks beautiful, okay? So, so uh, you know, so they often know how to extrapolate their data, you know, but, but, uh, but I think it's nice to do the DMC calculations and get, you know, kind of the real result. And it's nice that we agree with them, uh, you know, within essentially experimental error, even if this, this is at, you know, 900 GPA. So this extrapolations of theirs is working, you know, up to a terapascal, which is really incredible to me. So, uh, Okay, so I wanted to say something about uh, uh, other people's work, too. I mentioned at the beginning about the work on MGO. Uh, this is work that, uh, that again, uh, Alfe's group did, Dario Alfe at UCL did on uh, HCP iron. And, uh, and I put this up to, you know, I hope they are, do watch this on the web, you know. So, so, uh, um, so they mention it agrees with the DFT data of Soderlin et al. and Alfe et al., but they don't mention it agrees with, you know, our work, you know, that was done many years before them as well. But anyway, so, uh, so, uh, but, uh, but basically the DFT uh, calculation is the, uh, is, uh, a, a, is uh, the solid line here, and the, um, these points are their QMC calculations, these black points, and then the other points here are experiments. And you see this deviation at low pressure 
and that's due to the neglect of, uh, of magnetism in, in, in their calculations. So that's another thing to think about. You know, even when you do QMC, you know, if you leave some of the physics out, you know, you can't expect to get the right answers. If you do a, you know, a non-spin polarized calculation for a material that's actually magnetic, then, you know, you're not going to get perfect agreement. And uh, they went further, and I know that uh, Luke uh, Schulenberger, who's been also, uh, you know, teaching here at this school, is doing this sort of work now on other materials, uh, but I, uh, and maybe using the same uh, technique, but uh, this I found to be a very interesting application of QMC as well that they did, uh, where they took uh, 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 first principles molecular dynamic simulations from DFT, and then they took the snapshots, like, uh, you know, each one of these is, uh, uh, a different snapshot. So this uh, is over, you know, one and a half picoseconds, and so they just selected different configurations of atoms out of the uh, liquid simulation for liquid iron at high pressure. And then they did a, uh, a, a, a QMC calculation with diffusion Monte Carlo on that configuration of atoms. And so that's what this plot is up here showing the, uh, uh, actually, why are there two Yeah, 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 okay, right. One set of these is for the solid, one set of these is for the liquid, okay. And I have to look at the caption to see which is which. Okay, the top is the solid, okay. So for the solid, this is kind of what I showed before for quartz and stichovite, except now what we're looking is at just the energy at different snapshots for, for uh, blue is, uh, is solid, oh, red is liquid, and, uh, and the top one is DFT. Okay, so these are the DFT energies and these are the QMC energies. And one set is the solid and one set is the liquid, okay. So, uh, so basically they were able to get out a correction uh, to the DFT energies and then they used uh, simple perturbation theory to correct their free energies uh, based on this, uh, uh, they did kind of a sophisticated uh, approach to, to getting uh, a somewhat better result than just plugging in the difference in energy. And they got a correction to the uh, melting curve for iron uh, relative to uh, uh, DFT. And in the end here, um, I guess they end up with uh, uh, one or two points, which is their uh, diffusion Monte Carlo point of the melting temperature at, uh, that's uh, 300 GPA, uh, compared with different experiments and different, uh, and DFT and, and, and so forth. So, you know, this is probably the most accurate, uh, you know, estimate of where, uh, you know, the melting uh, temperature is. This has been a big uh, controversy even among experimentalists, uh, different studies have given different melting points for iron. It's very important in geophysics because the outer core of the Earth is liquid iron, the inner core is solid iron, so you really don't want to know, you know what that uh, temperature is where, where iron melts. Didn't they make it the New York Times last month? Did this? No, that was something else. That was, was resistivity. Iron, it, was, it was the same. Those were DFT well, calculations. Yeah, but those were DFT calculations. Yeah, so they, that's a study where they were calculating the thermal conductivity. They were saying that the core of the Earth is totally mysterious. So yeah, so I think that uh, shouldn't have been published, but <laughs> that's my own opinion. And I've got to be careful what I say, right? Okay, anyway. <laughs> so there's only a few examples of applications of QMC to geophysics. I, I'm making enemies, and then I wonder why I have enemies. So... Uh, Actually, they're doing great work. <laughs> so uh, uh, there's really uh, a lot of room for work in this area. I mean, it's one of the areas that I think uh, uh, you can get a lot of interest in what you're doing, uh, and it's very tractable. I mean, high pressure uh, area is more tractable because the energy scale is large, and so, so uh, uh, you know, if you're looking at, uh, you know, I don't know what, superconductivity or something, which has a very tiny energy scale, you know, it's very hard, you know, to make predictions, you know. But here we have a very large energy scale, you know, the, pr the problems are tractable, they're of interest to a whole field of people. Now that they're, I didn't talk about it, and I guess nobody else here is talking about it, but now that they've discovered all these exoplanets, you know, there's a tremendous amount of interest in, uh, in ultra-high pressure behavior because people are actually getting, uh, you know, astro astrophysical and uh, astronomical estimates of densities of, of, of other planets and other solar systems around other stars and they want to know equations of state for, you know, 
say, MGO, whatever, to much, much higher pressures than even exist in the Earth, you know, and, and so that they can compare with astronomical and astrophysical data. So, so you know, there's a lot of interest in this area right now, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit, and, you know, people have published a lot of uh, DFT calculations on these problems in, you know, journals like Nature and Science and, and PNAS and so forth, and, you know, you could do QMC on those systems and, you know, publish in those journals too, especially if you disagree with what the DFT people found, and you know, be careful about your pseudopotentials because when you use them to these, you know, uh, ultra-high pressures, you know, they may be breaking down, you know. So anyway, it's an area of a lot uh, possible uh, uh, stuff. So that's the end of talk number two. And actually, um, I th was supposed to end at 10.15, and I guess we're a few minutes early. We can take some questions here, and then I guess we can break a few minutes early. Any questions or discussion, I should say? This controversy with silicon, I guess, the phase transition. Well, do you do consider that a, I guess that's not an earth material. No, I we particularly didn't talk about other high pressure areas, no. but do you want to talk about it? No, that's right, yeah. <laughs> there have been a number of QMC calculations which are, controver are different, give different results, right? And so. Yeah, I don't have any slides on yeah. that. Do you okay. want to say something about no, that? Yeah. Do you have some opinions about that? <laughs> no, I, I think it's probably these errors that we worry about, pseudopotentials and fixed node errors and finite size corrections. Right. Yeah, so all, it's good to, to, to say more about that. So if, you're, if, you're, if your interest is really in fundamentals and fundamental development of techniques, you know, those are the three areas, you know, that people like I that are doing, say, more applications really would like to see, you know, solved, you know. So one is the pseudopotential issue, you know. We would, even if it's just like, use such a pseudopotential and you always get the right answer. I mean, that's almost good enough for me. It'd be nice to know why, but, uh, you know. And then the second thing is finite size correction. So whenever you do a QMC calculation, and, and it's been alluded to some and talked about some, but we, I don't think anybody's talked in detail about well, how they're done. The different ways of doing them. When, yeah. Method, yeah. Right, but there's different ways of approaching finite size corrections, and, and there's several sources of finite size errors. I mean, there's uh, basically uh, K-point sampling kind of errors. There are, are problems of just, uh, you know, your, your uh, Coulomb interaction and correlations being larger than the size of your, your cell and, and, and so forth. And there are different, you know, there's a literature on this, but, you know, it's important because if you apply them, uh, especially if you're comparing energies of different phases, you know, your, your finite size correction may be uh, you know, 90% accurate, but, you know, that remaining 10%, you know, might be enough to, you know, shift a transition pressure. And then the third thing was, um, so there was pseudopotentials, finite size corrections, and fixed node, fixed node approximation. So, uh, you know, basically your trial wave function or going beyond the, the fixed node approximation, and, uh, you know, and certainly that could uh, especially when you have these, uh, you know, enthalpies or free energies that are almost parallel, you know, certainly shift uh, transition pressures. Um, so, okay, so any other points or comments or? Okay, so we'll come back after uh, the break for something completely different. Produced by OCE Atlas Digital Media at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign.